I'm here to talk to you guys today about your favorite subject, drug and alcohol testing. So the police stop this elderly man at two o'clock in the morning and they ask him where he's going. He says he's on his way to a lecture about drinking, smoking, staying out late. The officer says, who on earth would be giving a lecture like that this time of night? The man says, that would be my wife. And if you guys think this is bad that you have to sit here and watch these slides every year on drug and alcohol testing, just remember, you could be the person who's collecting the samples all day. So all kidding aside, let's get down to the serious business of drug and alcohol awareness training and, of course, the policy review for bus drivers of Queen Anne's County Public Schools. So drug and alcohol use doesn't just affect the user, and of course, company drug and alcohol testing doesn't just affect the company. It would be similar to dropping a stone in a pond. You're gonna see the ripple effect, and it's gonna go both ways. Some statistics of drug and alcohol use and abuse. I'm not gonna go through every one of these statistics and start a presentation now, boring you with statistics, but there are some very informative pieces of information in these statistics. So let's look at the main points. 35% of employees have seen or heard of drug use on the job. 11% of employees were actually offered work, uh, drugs to use while at work. Half the people who went to an emergency room for a work-related injury tested positive for drugs and or alcohol. That was the result of a study that NIDA, National Institute of Drug Abuse, did with major metropolitan hospitals. Anyone who presented with a work injury, they actually tested them for drugs and alcohol, and more than half of the people who presented in these emergency rooms with a work injury tested positive for drugs and or alcohol, and in some cases, both. When we're talking about people without substance abuse problems, coworkers are three times as likely to be hospitalized. Uh, they miss more work. There's obviously a lot of problems associated. Of the people who called a cocaine hotline, 80% of them, more than actually 80% of them, admitted to using or dealing drugs while on the job. So it is a serious problem. 26.4 million people meet the diagnostic criteria of being what we would call substance abuse or substance dependent. That means that if they would meet the medical criteria to be admitted as an inpatient to a hospital, 16.2 million of these people were dependent on alcohol, 5.6 million were abusing or dependent on illicit drugs, and 4.6 million were dependent on both. So it's not always uh, limited to being off work. That's another thing that we have to uh, take into account. And also that these people, a lot of times people think that what people do on their own time is their business, but they're actually working full time. So these are not people who are just occasionally dabbling with some drugs and you know maybe reporting to work or working part time. Of those 26.4 million people that we saw that were substance dependent, 61%, a majority of them, were employed full time. Um, again, they miss more time than other people. Um, they tend to be late for work. So they cause a lot of other problems in addition to the safety concerns. So let's do an overview of the DOT and what they require for drug and alcohol testing. And you guys obviously are tested under the US DOT, Department of Transportation, because you fall under Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. So the first thing that we have to recognize is, although the DOT does allow for a second chance for someone who tests positive for drugs or alcohol, the state of Maryland has a zero tolerance policy for school bus drivers. And Maryland Comar actually requires that a person with a verified drug or alcohol test greater than 0.04 will be decertified for a period of no less than 10 years. So if you test positive, 
positive in any of the 23 counties or Baltimore City for a drug test or you do a refusal or any other policy violation that would be considered the same as a positive or you have an alcohol concentration greater than 0.04, you will be decertified for a period of no less than 10 years. So the state of Maryland takes it very seriously. Okay, so let's look at the DOT testing panel. Well, in addition to marijuana, PCP, amphetamines, cocaine, and opiates, the opiates up until 2018 were always codeine, morphine, and heroin. But now, as of 2018, so actually for four years now, we've been testing for these additional opiates, which are highly abused prescription drugs. Hydrocodone, most people know it as Vicodin, Morphone, most people know it as Dilaudid, Oxycodone, most people know it as Percocet, Oxymorphone, most people know it as Opana. These were added to the testing panel, so these are additional opiates that are part of the DOT testing panel. So what exactly is the drug testing progress? Well, all of the samples, initially when they're, when they're collected, they're sent to the lab and they're subject to initial screening. Uh, the initial screening is the um, initial screening for the presence of drugs. They also test them for specimen validity to make sure that it actually is human urine and nobody's tampered with it or poured any of these cocktails and concoctions that they sell at gas stations and convenience stores to be a drug test. So they screen the sample once they test for specimen validity and they do the initial screening. If the initial screening is negative, it's negative. That's it. It's done. If it's non-negative, it then goes for confirmation testing. Confirmation testing is going to identify the exact metabolite, the exact drug metabolite, and the amount of the metabolite. The cutoff levels are established by HHS, and these do change periodically. A good example of the cutoff levels would be the marijuana cutoff level. The marijuana cutoff level for THC is 15 nanograms. Now, they've established that to be a fair cutoff level based on these studies that HHS does where they put people in hermetically sealed phone booth type situations and they blow pot smoke on them all day and then they test them and the highest anybody ever came in was 10 so they added another five nanograms to it so that way the cutoff level is high enough another example was cocaine cocaine used to be 300 it has now been reduced to 150 based on studies done by HHS Every sample, positive or negative, it doesn't matter, every DOT sample does go to the MRO, which is the medical review officer. This is a doctor who's trained in forensic toxicology and knows DOT drug and alcohol testing rules. They will, on any non-negative sample, call the donor and do an interview. There's also the split sample. All you guys know when you go in, we take the sample, we give you the cup, you come out, the collector's going to split it into two, two transport tube bottles, the A and the B. The reason for that, the lab is only going to open up and test the A bottle. In the event that the A bottle were to test positive, it's your right as a driver to have the B, the B bottle, the second bottle, which is still sealed up with a tamper evidence seal, sent to to a second certified laboratory to be retested. If the second certified laboratory doesn't find what the first lab found, the entire test is canceled. So in a urine drug screen, again, we call it a nine to five, even though there's a few more drugs in there, but these are the main classifications of drugs. For a drug screen, testing can occur anytime you're on duty. And for the federal motor carrier, they can call you in on your day off for a drug test. Alcohol testing is a little different. Alcohol is legal in this country, so you cannot come in on your day off for an alcohol test. You also cannot take an alcohol test if you're not driving that day. Um, if you're ready to drive or a possibility to drive, that counts. But they cannot call you in on your day off to have an alcohol test. 
This is the um, estimated or approximate times that drugs stay in the system. It varies, obviously, person to person, what drug they're taking, how they used it, what other drugs they're taking. But an average window of detection for opiates is two to four days. For cocaine is eight to 48 hours. Amphetamines, two to four days. PCP, two to four days. Marijuana, two days to six weeks. Benzodiazepines, those aren't on a DOT drug test, but they are on the Queen Anne's County post-accident test. Benzos, a good example of those would be Valium, Xanax, Ativan. Those stay in your system for one to three days. Barbiturates, again, they're not on the DOT drug screen, but they are on the Queen Anne's County post-accident panel. Those would be Secanol, Tuanol, Phenobarbital. Those stay in your system two to 10 days. So all results, all DOT and all laboratory non-negative results, so that would include your non-DOT Queen Anne's County post-accident, any non-negative result and all DOT results are sent to the medical review officer for interpretation and review before the results are considered final or before they are reported to the county. So when you do the collection and we ask you for your best phone number, Number or numbers, day and evening preferred. Those numbers are the numbers that are provided to the MRL or the medical review officer. This is the doctor who, if you're positive on a laboratory report, is going to contact you and allow you an opportunity to provide a medically legitimate explanation for a positive drug test. So if you had maybe taken a cough syrup with codeine and you tested positive for opiates, you would then provide the physician, the doctor, the MRO with your medication, the prescription. They would verify it with the pharmacy and they would report it as negative. That is their role. They are licensed physicians with a knowledge of substance abuse disorders and forensic toxicology. They're impartial, independent from the lab. They uh, do the donor interview and make the determination. They are considered the gatekeeper in the DOT drug testing process. So what about prescription drugs? Again, all prescription drugs are verified by the MRO if the laboratory reports those results as positive. As part of the verification process, the MRO may speak to the prescribing physician. They will definitely speak to the pharmacy that filled your prescription. And you, as the donor, bear the burden of providing them the information that they need in order to conduct that interview and to complete that verification. If you fail to provide the documentation to them, they are going to report you as positive. So when the MRO calls and they ask you to provide the information, it's imperative that you return the call promptly and that you provide the information as expeditiously as possible in order to get your case closed and get it reported as negative. Now, if you do test positive and the MRO says, I'm going to call this a positive drug screen, you do have the opportunity, have the sample retested at a second certified laboratory. And that also goes for a non-DOT post-accident. White Glove follows the DOT procedures. So you would have the opportunity to have the same sample. You don't get to give a second sample, but to have the same sample retested at a certified Certified lab, a second certified laboratory. And again, just like with the DOT, if the second lab doesn't find what the first lab found, the entire test is canceled. Now, if you have a positive test, obviously I've said it before, but I'm going to say it again. Maryland has a zero tolerance policy for school bus drivers. In addition to the clearinghouse, which is a nationwide Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration clearinghouse that your drug test is going to be entered on. So any place that you choose to use your CDL license is going to know you had a positive drug test. There are steps the DOT will allow you 
you to return to safety sensitive duties using your CDL or DOT driver's license. However, that is not applying to the uh, position of a school bus driver. You cannot drive for any of the 23 counties or Baltimore City for a period of 10 years. Your name will go in a database at the Maryland State Department of Education and you will be prohibited from operating a school bus for a public school system in the state of Maryland for a period of 10 years. So before allowing any covered person to perform safety sensitive functions for the first time, the employer, Queen Anne's County, must have a negative drug test result from the medical review officer. A safety sensitive function would be behind the wheel duties. Behind the wheel duties on a public road. Once you get that CDL learner's permit and you start practicing on a public road, that is considered behind the wheel a safety sensitive function function and they require all applicants to submit to pre-employment testing. So random testing, everybody in the uh, CDL pool is included in the random pool. Every bus driver that I have on the list, which is periodically reviewed by um, Queen Anne's County Public Schools, once you take a pre-employment, your name automatically goes on the random pool list. Everyone has an equal chance of being selected. Each and every random selection Every person has an equal chance of being selected. So post accidents. This is very, very, very important. You must report all accidents immediately. It does not matter what is the nature of the accident. Any accident or incident, you must report it immediately to Queen Anne's County. Reporting it when you get back to the yard, reporting it the next morning is not acceptable. You must report report all accidents and incidents immediately to the Board of Education, Queen Anne's County Public Schools. Failure to report an accident or incident may lead to disciplinary action, including you being determined no longer qualified to provide services. It is imperative that they be notified immediately of these accidents or incidents. It is in, quite embarrassing for them to receive a phone call from a parent about an incident that they have no idea or knowledge of. Sometimes there are photographs that need to be taken, documents that need to be completed, and that needs to be done quickly and at the time. Time, not later on okay it's also a policy requirement that the that whoever is involved submit to a post accident or post incident drug and alcohol test if you fail to report these you are not following policy and you're not submitting to this testing as required so this is a very very serious issue and um, it's been a, a quite problematic to be quite honest and frank with you and this is one of the areas where the county does intend to um, let's just say they tend to focus on enforcement of this so I'm imploring you if you have any accident or incident immediately report it do not assume that it was minor and no one cares report it call and report it do yourself a favor call and report it Slides were out of order, I apologize. Uh, random testing, we're back, jumping back and forth. Random testing has to be unannounced, unpredictable. It's spread out throughout the year. Again, I said earlier that alcohol testing can only um, be conducted when you're actually driving. However, drug testing can be conducted anytime. You, alcohol is legal. They can call you in on your day off to have a drug test. You could be cutting your grass, having a beer. They cannot call you in on your day off to have an alcohol test. You cannot be on your day off cutting your grass, smoking grass. That is not acceptable. 
So post-accident testing, again, sorry about that, we're jumping around, it was out of order. Uh, post-accident testing is conducted on any employee involved in an on-the-job accident, vehicular or otherwise, okay? And that can include incidents. It doesn't necessarily have to be an accident. Incidents would also qualify for that. Any situation where the employee's performance could have been a contributing factor and or to mitigate liability for Queen Anne's County Public Schools. This may seem very onerous to you guys and you may think, well, it's not directed at you. It is to actually protect you. It is to your benefit that they have this policy. What what this policy does is puts a hedge of protection around you by demonstrating you know we don't know exactly who did what but what we do know is the Queen Anne's County public school bus driver was not under the influence of drugs or alcohol okay and t testing that is conducted um, by QA CPS the employees can be placed on administrative leave pending the results of this test now we can do these screening tests right at white gloves so usually there's no waiting for the results however the county does reserve the right to place you on administrative leave so sometimes if the screening test is positive particularly if the screening test is going to be positive for a narcotic habit forming drug or illicit drug in all likelihood they're going to what we call stand you down until they get the results from the lab. The good news is if it's negative, we have it the next day from the lab. If it's not negative, it's going to be a couple days. And I, and I know this is unfortunate, but it's for the safety. No one wants to hear that, you know, you had an accident on Monday. You tested preliminarily positive for a narcotic. They let you go drive the school bus and you had another accident and someone was further injured. They would be in serious trouble for a lack of... of proper enforcement of the policy if they did that so to make sure everybody's safe because safety is always our primary concern in drug testing drug testing is not about catching people or finding out what drugs people are using drug testing was implemented for one reason safety the safety of the vehicles the safety of the people driving the vehicles the safety of the students and residents of the county So, DOT, post-accident. Now, this is when we're going to do a DOT post-accident drug test. Anytime there's a fatality, you are going to do a DOT post-accident drug test. Any vehicle that gets towed from the scene and the Queen Anne's County Public School bus driver is issued a citation within 32 hours of the accident, a DOT post-accident drug test is required. Anyone who receives medical attention away from the scene and the Queen Anne's County bus driver is issued a citation within 32 hours, there is going to be a DOT post-accident drug test. Now, there may be an instance where you have an accident and you go over for the drug test at White Glove and we do the non-DOT Queen Anne's County drug test on you three o'clock in the afternoon. And later on in the evening, after further investigation, the sheriffs determine or the state police determine that you were at fault and someone was towed and they do issue you a citation. At that point, you're gonna need to go back to White Glove to have a DOT drug test done. The alcohol testing is the same, so we can just upgrade a, a non-DOT alcohol test to a DOT. But the drug test is different, and it's a different test, so we have to do a DOT specific on a federal chain of custody form for the post-accident. So you may have to go back and take another test. For alcohol testing, it's the same rules. If there's a fatality, you're going to have a DOT post-accident alcohol test. If any vehicle is towed and the Queen Anne's County bus driver gets a citation within eight hours of the accident, we're going to require a DOT post-accident alcohol test. If anyone receives medical attention away from the scene, 
and the Queen Anne's County bus driver gets a citation within eight hours of the accident. Again, we're going to do a DOT post-accident alcohol test. So it's eight hours for the alcohol test, 32 hours for the drug. You may go over and do the county drug test, like I say, or you will go over and do the county drug test but if, if no tickets were issued immediately. The alcohol test, we can just upgrade that to a DOT. You would have to, though, if you get the ticket, go take another drug test for the DOT. So if the DOT criteria is not met, it says it may be conducted, it will be conducted. They do an accident after every test in this county, or a test after every accident in this county. So you will be sent for a post-accident or incident drug test and alcohol test. Alcohol testing will occur, it should occur within two hours, but if it's not, uh, doesn't occur within eight hours, we can't do the testing. Drug testing, again, should occur right away. If it's not done within 32 hours, again, we can't do the testing. And again, um, before I go on to reasonable suspicion, I just wanna reiterate, it is critical, critical, critical that you guys report your accidents in a timely fashion, meaning immediately. So reasonable suspicion is the belief that an employee or a driver is using or has used drugs or alcohol in violation of Queen Anne's County's policy. It's drawn from specific, contemporaneous, articulable observations concerning the appearance, behavior, speech, or body odors of the employee. What in the Sam Hill does that mean? That means that a trained supervisor has to be able to, it's gotta be contemporaneous, meaning it's going on right now. It can't be something that happened last week, last night, last month. Right now, these signs and symptoms are being observed. Articulable, that means that they can put it in writing. It can't be a hunch, okay? It has to be something that they can put in writing. Odor of alcohol, slurred speech, staggering, um, red eyes, these kinds of things. Uh, it's um, observations concerning your appearance, behavior, speech, or body odors, okay? Now, I will tell you this about reasonable suspicion testing, and it does have to be a trained supervisor that makes these um, observations. Because you guys are school bus drivers, you're held at a higher standard. That was the DOT definition for a reasonable suspicion test. In the DOT world, if somebody were to call Queen Anne's County Public Schools, if they weren't, you guys weren't school bus drivers, and someone were to say, you know, I saw the driver weaving all over the road, or I saw the driver doing this, they would document it, but that would pretty much be the end of it. Because you guys are school bus drivers, you're held at a higher standard for obvious safety concerns. If they get that kind of phone call, they are going to do a reasonable suspicion drug and alcohol test, not to blame you, not to accuse you, actually to vindicate you, to cover you, again, like the post-accident for your protection. This testing is non-DOT, so this would be done under Queen Anne's County Public School Policy, it's gonna be the test where we get the results right away, so you're not gonna be you know, put off work, standing down, but they are, if they get those kind of calls um, and they have uh, issues that don't meet the DOT criteria, I can absolutely guarantee you will be taken for a test. And again, it is not to accuse you, it is to vindicate you, to demonstrate that there's no problem here. It's a fact-finding issue. It's an issue of protecting the county and protecting you. But for reasonable suspicion training for the DOT, it has to be a trained supervisor, meaning a supervisor who has undergone a minimum of two hours of reasonable suspicion training. The alcohol testing can only be done if the observations are made just before, during, or after the period of the workday. Again, one of these trained supervisors can't see you at the Elks Lodge dancing on the bar at night and then come in the next day and say, I'm gonna send you for a test. It would have to be while you were actually supposedly driving the bus. 
Okay, uh, federal motor carrier requires that the supervisor completes a written report within 24 hours of the observation. Um, it's Queen Anne's County policy that the supervisor complete a report, whether it's DOT or not. And the report will, con will contain the documentation and the reasons that the supervisor is requiring the reasonable suspicion testing. So you would be presented with that information. They're not just gonna do it behind your back. You you would be presented with that information. We got a call, this person was saying bus 22 was all over the road. You know, we don't think you were doing anything, but just to be safe, we have to do this testing. A good example for you guys would be in one of the other counties, um, there was a sports team that was a baseball team that was being transferred transported to another county for a game and they won it was a big game and after the game they were all taken out to a Mexican restaurant and the driver was actually invited to join them at the restaurant the school bus driver and um, the school bus driver was actually having a non-alcoholic what looked like a margarita well someone else in the restaurant recognized that it was a school bus and the school you know the sports team and the driver and called the board of education and said you're you had a driver sitting here drinking in this restaurant and of course the transportation supervisor had to get in the car go to the restaurant and perform an alcohol test on the scene the driver said it's non-alcoholic which the alcohol test confirmed it wasn't what that did was protected that driver it also protected those students those parents and the board from any further um, accusations Okay, so in the expanded panel testing, now if you get sent over for the test because somebody made a complaint or it's something outside the DOT, well, they're gonna probably test for the expanded panel. On the left-hand side of the screen in black, these are the drugs that the DOT tests for. The DOT tests for marijuana, the DOT tests for opiates. Those include codeine, morphine, 6-MAM, which is a metabolite of heroin, and the four semi-synthetic opiates I told you about earlier, hydrocodone, hydromorphone, oxycodone, oxymorphone. The DOT tests for amphetamines, the DOT test for methamphetamine, the DOT test for ecstasy, the DOT test is for cocaine, and the DOT test for PCP. However, the county test will include all those drugs on the left-hand side of the screen in black, and the post-accident test, as well as the reasonable suspicion, will include those drugs. In addition, it will include these drugs in red. Benzos, Valium, Xanax, Ativan, Barbiturates, Buprenorphine or Suboxone, Fentanyl, it will also include K2, methadone. There is a series of, of 17 drugs in the non-DOT panel. So you will be tested for additional substances. And again, I'm gonna remind you one more time that Maryland has a zero tolerance policy for school bus drivers and any verified positive drug test or confirmed alcohol test with a result of 0.04 or greater will result in decertification for a period of no less than 10 years. A verified positive drug test and a confirmed alcohol test greater than 0.04 will also be posted on the FMCSA Drug and Alcohol Clearinghouse. So any of these things will be considered a refusal to test. Failure to appear for a test within a reasonable amount of time, failure to remain at the testing site, failure to provide a test, and you guys can see I forgot to update the slide. It should say Queen Anne's County. Um, refusal to allow observation or monitoring of a specimen collection when it's required. If you come out of the restroom and the sample is cold or smells like bleach or there's something funny going on, you're going to have to submit to a second collection under direct observation. Direct observation means you have to do the up, down, turn around. You have to lift all your clothing above the navel, turn around, pants, underpants, pantyhose, to uh, mid-thigh, turn around. A collector of the same sex will be observing this and they, they will watch you provide your sample from body to bottle. 
If the MRO reports your sample is invalid, you're going to have to get a direct observation. If you fail to provide a sufficient urine or breast sample and you don't have a medical explanation, so if you come over to the office and you go to provide a sample and you give us an inadequate sample, we're going to start what's called the shy bladder process, which means you're given 40 ounces of, of water that's distributed over the three-hour period. If you cannot provide the sample at the end of the three hours, we will discontinue the collection process and you'll be sent for a shy bladder medical evaluation. If the doctor determines that there was no valid medical explanation for your failure to provide a sample, that would be deemed a refusal to test. And it would be the same thing for a breath test. If you didn't give enough air for us to get an adequate breath sample and you were sent to a physician and they said there's nothing wrong, this person could certainly have blown into the machine to provide an adequate sample, you would be deemed a refusal to test, which carries the same consequence as a positive. Failure to take a second test, the employer or the collector has directed you to take. This is where the post-accident could come in. And for bus drivers, this is the number one thing I see where bus drivers get a refusal to test. Because like I said, you took the test under county policy, then a couple hours later, a ticket's issued, and now it becomes a DOT test, and you're told, go back and take a test. And you're like, I already took my test. No, you took a non-DOT test under company policy. You did not take the DOT test and if you fail to take that DOT test within the allotted time which is the DOT says 32 hours from the accident you are a refusal to test there's no wiggle room there's no do-overs it's plain and simple a refusal to test also while I'm on the subject for post-accident this would include making sure that your contractor and the board has a valid phone number to get a hold of you because if if the accident's wrapped up at three o'clock in the afternoon noon and then seven o'clock at night the sheriffs or the state police determine you were at fault and issue a citation somebody needs to be able to get a hold of you to tell you you need to report immediately for your dot drug test if they can't get a hold of you and 32 hours elapse that is not on them that is on you and you are deemed a refusal to test because you were not readily available to take the test So if you get caught wearing a device that's intended to help you pass a drug test, that's going to be a refusal to test. If you admit, it, admit to adulterating or substituting the specimen to the collector or to the medical review officer, that's going to be considered a refusal to test. If the MRO reports your sample as adulterated or substituted, that's going to be considered a refusal to test. For alcohol testing, if you uh, fail or refuse to sign step two, and then employees who are subject to post-accident testing and don't remain readily available, including notifying the employer or the board of your location or where you are, they don't have a valid phone number. If you leave the scene of the accident prior to being told you have to take a test, these are all things that are considered a refusal to test. A refusal to test carries the same consequence as a positive, which is the decertified for 10 years. So it is a serious business. If you uh, are unable to provide the sample for the uh, urine, the three hours goes by, you have the shy bladder or the shy lung, and they set you up an appointment for a medical evaluation and you don't go to that appointment, you're automatically deemed a refusal to test. If you fail to cooperate with the testing process, you don't empty your pockets, you refuse to wash your hands, you become disruptive or combative during the collection process, you are deemed a refusal to test. And then for a direct observation, I already went through this, if you fail to raise your clothing, lower the pants, allow the observer to watch you go from body to bottle, that's going to be a refusal to test. So some other behaviors that are prohibited by Queen Anne's County. It is illegal to manufacture, distribute, dispense, or possess a drug or drug paraphernalia on Queen Anne's County premises. 
You cannot be under the influence of alcohol while on the job. You cannot have unauthorized consumption or possession of alcohol while on the Queen Anne's County Public School premises. That includes the bus. The bus is considered Queen Anne's County Public School premises. Even though the contractors own the bus, the bus at the time when it's being used, when a bus is being used to transport students from the entire time it leaves the yard till it returns to the yard, it is being considered Queen Anne's County Public School property. So it can be searched and it should not have any alcohol on board. Off the job, illegal use or activity which results in a criminal conviction. This is a behavior that can get you decertified for 10 years. Any violation of these prohibited behaviors may be considered grounds for immediate termination and any illegal substances will be turned over to the appropriate law enforcement. So I know you guys, especially when you're, you know, transport middle age, high school, um, you know, it, that's why it's kind of really important that you check your bus, that somebody may not have left any illegal uh, substances on the bus and that if you do find any you immediately call the board and have that so they can uh, have law enforcement come and confiscate the substance don't just pick it up and throw it away in another county I had that some students left a bag of marijuana on the bus the driver just threw it away and some other child reported that they had saw the marijuana on the bus seat pulled the film sure enough there was the driver walking over picking up the bag of marijuana and throwing it away and the driver was terminated and again Maryland has a zero tolerance policy so some other things that you want to be uh, made aware of Queen Anne's County does have a policy that you make sure that you let any prescribing physician know that you're a bus driver before you start taking medication, um, you need to make sure that that medication is reported. If you get any medication where it's got that sleepy eye on the label or it says uh, may cause drowsiness, do not operate machinery or drive a vehicle, that is not a medication that you should be taking while operating a school bus. So if you are, especially on a short term because of an acute injury or whatever, you need to notify your contractor and or the board that you cannot drive. You can also call White Glove to get this medication um, documented that you are unable to perform functions during the use of this medication and to get these medications cleared. And you are required to inform any physician before you receive any medication that you are a CDL driver and that you are covered under FMCSA. Now, the Federal Motor Carrier does have a nice form. It's the driver medication form that you can take to your doctor. Your doctor can fill it out. Your doctor reads that you're a driver. They read the definition of safety sensitive functions and the doctor can then sign and say, I understand they're a driver. I don't have a problem with them taking this medication and operating the school bus. So it's imperative that you follow these procedures. Um, you can get the form from the board. You can get the form from White Glove. Um, you can probably, maybe possibly get it from your contractor. Call White Glove if you're not sure. Always call White Glove. The reason that it's imperative that you get this form filled out Okay, there is a thing called a safety letter, and this started in 2018 with the addition of these additional drugs. So you test laboratory positive for a substance. Let's just say codeine in this example. The MRO is going to call you. They find out that you have you know, a prescription. They talk to the pharmacy. Everything's legitimate. They report it as negative to the county. It's a negative drug test because you had a legitimate prescription for the metabolite in your name. However, if they don't speak to the physician who filled the, who wrote the prescription, which 99% of the time does not happen, they usually just verify with the pharmacy. If they don't speak to your doctor within five days, they are bound under DOT regulations to issue what is called a safety concern, which says the driver tested negative. However, I have a safety concern 
with regards to use of this medication. And on a DOT physical, it says on the physical that a driver is disqualified from driving if they are taking a narcotic or habit-forming medication unless the medication was prescribed by a physician who is familiar with the driver's occupation and is familiar with the driver's health and is also willing to uh, test that the medication, they have no safety concerns regarding the use of that medication. So if all those things don't line up, then there is going to be the safety letter. Now, if once the safety letter is issued, then the county is required to send you back to the doctor who did your DOT physical to get you a fitness for duty. If you have that form, then that's going to avoid a lot of this. If you reported it on your DOT physical, that's going to avoid a lot of this. If you're taking any medications on a consistent basis, even if you only take them occasionally, let's say you have you know, a bad back and you take um, a, a, a muscle relaxer occasionally, that needs to be reported on your DOT physical form even if you take it occasionally because you have a consistent prescription. If you have you know, trouble sleeping and you're taking a benzo at night, that needs to be reported on your DOT physical form. If you had a knee replacement and they gave you 30 oxycodones postoperatively, well, that's an acute issue. You're only gonna be taking it for the short period of time. And while you're uh, recovering from your knee replacement, you're not going to be driving. By the time you're ready to come back from driving, you're done taking your Percocet. So that shouldn't need to be on the form. If you're taking something on a long-term basis, it would need to be on the DOT physical. If you fail to disclose it to the DOT physical medical examiner and a fitness for duty issue is a letter is, you know, safety concern and you have to go back for a fitness for duty, that doctor can disqualify you because you failed to disclose those medications. So it's imperative. If you guys have any questions about this, please call White Glove. That's what we're here for. We're here to help you. It's not your program. It's not the county's program. It's not my program. It's our program collectively. We're all working together to have a safe and productive workplace. So if you have questions or concerns or you're not sure, just call White Glove. I'm more than happy to answer your questions. You're prohibited from performing safety sensitive duties if you've used any drug or controlled substance that results in physical or mental impairment. Again, the sleepy eye, the you know, do not drive or operate heavy machinery. You have to make sure the prescribing physician is aware you're a school bus driver before you take anything. And if you take it, it's gonna come out in the form of a possible post-accident test or even a reasonable suspicion because sometimes you never know how medication is going to react. Sometimes people take a medication and their whole persona changes and that's enough to trigger reasonable suspicion and then it comes out, you're taking this medication. Just be safe. Don't do it unless you've cleared it with everybody, all parties concerned. So obviously there's no such thing as medical marijuana. I'm using the term loosely for the uh, presentation of this slide. Um, the Drug Free Workplace Act of 1988 prohibits the use of a controlled substance in the workplace. Marijuana is a schedule one drug. Schedule one means there is no medical use for it. Uh, the state may call it medical marijuana, and I'm putting that in quotes, air quotes, but there is no such thing as medical marijuana. It cannot legally be prescribed in any of the 50 states. It is a Schedule One drug, and federal always supersedes. The DOT has published several notices on this. It is a Schedule One drug. There is zero excuse for a positive THC. The medical review officer cannot excuse or allow any marijuana, period. It's a 10-year decertification. The DOT went so far to redefine the term prescription because again, a, a physician cannot legally prescribe a Schedule One drug. What these doctors do at these dispensaries is make a recommendation that you use marijuana, but they cannot write it down on a prescription pad. 
hemp products. There's a lot of hemp products out there. Uh, they do have warning labels on them. I would suggest you don't take anything that contains any hemp because you don't know what it contains. The hemp farm bill of uh, 2018 posed a lot of problems because it allowed hemp products containing less than 0.03% THC, made them legal. However, nobody is regulating these products, so nobody knows. So the label may tell you there's no THC in it, but the drug test says, guess what? There was THC, and the drug test is what's going to get you decertified for 10 years, not the label off of the product you may or may not have taken. So my advice to you is do not take anything that contains hemp, period. You have no way to know where it came from. You have no way to know whether the THC has been removed. Do not believe the labels. So that's going to get me to CBD. CBD is like playing Russian roulette. CBD is the latest and greatest phase and craze. Everybody's using CBD. Everybody's selling CBD. The problem is nobody at this current time is regulating CBD. So everybody in this audience can go out and order you up some little fancy bottles from Amazon and get you a fancy label maker. And you can put whatever you want in those bottles, label it CBD, sell it for $39.95 a pop, and guess what? You haven't broken any laws because there is no regulation. So the label will tell you it's fine, it doesn't contain this, it doesn't contain that. The labels are liars. The DEA routinely screens CBD products. It goes out, it, it buys these products, they claim, and it screens them, and it reports the results of the screenings on the website. The DEA has reported CBD products containing as much as 60% THC. The DEA has reported CBD products containing lead, containing arsenic, containing fentanyl, containing cocaine. The DEA has reported CBD products that don't have any CBD at all. CBD products that are motor oil, CBD products that are vegetable oil. Uh, the DEA back in uh, January confiscated a large shipment of what was labeled these CBD tablets coming across the border. Uh, it turned out these were actually dog flea pills that the drug cartels had repackaged as CBD, and they were actually dog flea medicine that had expired and been discarded, and it was repackaged. So you have no idea what you're getting. You don't know if you test positive on a drug test, you are going to be decertified for 10 years. The medical review officer will not and cannot accept any medical explanation for that of CBD or any of the like products. The only exception to that is Epidiolex. Epidiolex is the first and only FDA approved CBD. It is not gotten through these, you know, uh, Avon ladies riding around with CBD on the back of their car or the over-the-counter or the gas station. You have to have a written prescription for this. It is actually um, manufactured by a legitimate pharmaceutical provider. They know the amount of CBD in, or I'm sorry, THC in the product. It is prescribed for children with seizures. However, there are some doctors writing it off label, but Epidiolex and a prescription for Epidiolex would be the only thing that would be considered a medically legitimate explanation other than Marinol or Dronabinol, which are synthetic forms of THC that have been on the market since the mid 80s they're prescribed for people with cancer and stage renal and um end stage hiv or aids rather so the cutoff levels i talked about those earlier passive inhalation a lot of times when people test positive for marijuana they'll try to say they were around other people that is not a legitimate excuse. The cutoff levels are raised high enough so that passive inhalation, as we call it, would not be an explanation. You could ride back and forth to the airport with Bob Marley in the car, and unless you actually take a hit, you're not going to test positive. So White Glove is available.
24 hours a day, seven days a week. If you have any questions or concerns, it again is our mutual program. It's all of us included. Um, the way we make it a better program is through keeping the lines of communication open. If there's a problem that I don't know about, I can't help you solve it. I'm not about problems, I'm about solutions. We're here to help, we're here to answer your questions. We're here to, to provide a safe and productive workplace for you guys that are providing these services, these integral and critical services for the students and residents of Queen Anne's County. And God bless you all for what you do. Thank you.